All right. Oh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Leiswitz. I'm a faculty member over at the Yale School of the Environment, where I direct the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Uh, here, we're going to be uh, hearing about uh, this particular talk called Navigating the Future, Harnessing Data-Driven Insights on Climate Mobility to Build a Common Agenda. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome to Yale two friends of mine who I was just with last week at Climate Week in New York. Um, doing a really big and exciting and really important effort to look at climate migration, climate force displacement of peoples, and how do we begin to think proactively about managing what is likely to be many millions of people being uh, forced to move either temporarily or permanently. So um, unfortunately, the reality of climate change is all too evident uh, over the, the certainly this past summer with all-time record global temperatures, but this has been happening now for many, many years for those that have been paying attention, and uh, it's only getting more intense. So uh, this is an incredibly uh, time-appropriate conversation to be having, and I'm just super excited to welcome uh, both of them to Yale to help brief us about some of the work they've been doing. Here they're going to unpack the efforts of the Global Center for Climate Mobility, which they have uh, spearheaded, to further climate mobility knowledge and solutions. They will underscore the importance of data, modeling and stakeholder engagement to support proactive adaption strategies for communities confronting the climate crisis. Uh, and so they're really going to be presenting this larger approach of the GCCM, anticipate, plan, and transform, and discuss the findings and recommendations of their Africa Climate Mobility Initiative, which is where they've started, as well as ongoing work to expand this in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so I'll let them describe the project in more detail, but let me quickly introduce them. Uh, David Lonberg serves as the Senior Advisor for Youth and Outreach at the Global Center for Climate Mobility, where he supports the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative, the Greater Caribbean Climate Mobility Initiative, and the Rising Nations Initiative. So you can see this is now very popular work, um, as well as the development of the GCCM Solutions Lab. He previously worked at NGO Shift 7 and the UN Non-Governmental Liaison Service. He also served as an advisor to the Federal Foreign Office of Germany and a consultant to UNICEF's Office of Innovation. He holds a Master's in International Affairs from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. And Sarah Rosengarter uh, currently serves as the lead for knowledge and practice of the Global Center for Climate Mobility, where she oversees the efforts of the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative and the Greater Caribbean Climate Mo Mobility Initiative as well as the uh, development of GCCM's Global Knowledge Hub with the Columbia University Climate School. She's a fellow at the Zolberg Institute for Migration and Mobility at the New School and an adjunct lecturer at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. She previously held advisory roles with several foundations, universities, and the UN Secretary General on Migration, Peter Sutherland, focusing on improving cooperation on and the governance of international migration. She holds degrees in political science from the Free University in Berlin and Sciences Po in Paris. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, both to Yale. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks to everybody for coming, everybody in the room, everybody online. Very excited to be here. Thanks to the Macmillan Center for hosting us. I'm David. And I'm Sarah. <laughs> Thank and you. And yeah. Shall we started. hit it off? Yeah. See if we can get it to work. So this is when, what we're going to talk about today. So we thought we'd do a little bit of introduction of who we are and the Global Center for Climate Mobility, GCCM. So if you hear GCCM, we come from the UN. We use a lot of acronyms. Sorry in advance. That's how it's going to be. Uh, so I'm also going to talk about the regional climate mobility initiatives and how sort of the overall model is set up of, of how we're working. And then Sarah will go into more depth and talk about the African Climate Mobility Initiative, also referred to as ACMI. So if somebody here ACMI. That's it. And then we have the Greater Caribbean Climate Mobility Initiative, GCCMI, to make it even harder. Um, yeah. Sarah's going to talk about that as well. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. If there are any burning questions, throw up a hand. We're easy going. We'll get to it. And we can say, oh, we'll come back to that, or we'll take it right away. So we'll try to make this as interactive as and, and, and fun as possible. Uh, you're very smart people here, so I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. And don't hold me too long so you forget them. So looking at our goals as for our organization, we have three, thi three things that we try to mention. It's anticipate, plan, and transform. So the anticipatory part is to focus on all the early action and being out early and to be able to understand what is going to happen when it comes to climate forced mi migration and displacement. 
also referred to as climate mobility. Then, based on that information that we get through the knowledge work that we do, we then try to convene policymakers and stakeholders in different convenings to plan for what's ahead. With that information and with those coalitions, then looking at how we can guide adaptation work and also work with the development planning and investments to address this in, in, in climate mobility hotspots. We will come back to this notion of hotspots and, and, and what that means, but that's something that you will hear quite a lot in this presentation. So how do we do this when we're trying to address these goals? We build knowledge, we advance policy, and we accelerate diplomacy and enable practice. Big words, but we try to live up to them, and we try to do various things within them. Sarah, as you heard in, in, in the introduction from Tony, is leading our knowledge work that really focus on how the fr frontline communities are going to be affected during the climate crisis and what that's going to do for mobility. Based on that inf information, we're then trying to advance coalitions uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to policy to take action, achieve justice, and also then advance in these different fields that you see that are outlined, peace building, development, etc., in the policy area. How this is done as well is through accelerating diplomacy. We are come from the UN after all, and we work in that space, uh, so we are, have something to do with diplomacy. Uh, this is a picture from last week. Actually, both these pictures are from last week. But that's John Kerry, and this is the president of the UN General Assembly at our Sea Level Rise Summit that we had last Thursday. So see how can we foster narratives and advance climate mobility in the international diplomatic space. And also back to Sarah when it comes to practice. How do we can, can we foster a community of practice uh, around the world that works on these topics? We'll come back to this a bit more as well when we look at the different initiatives and what we do in the different regions. So looking at the regional models that we are using for these different initiatives. So we're working towards people-centered climate action. We can talk about mitigation, we can talk about different things that we need to do because of, to tackle the climate crisis, but we're also trying to bring back the people into this discussion, and that's central when you talk about mobility and migration. So it is a joint undertaking, and that's something we say we're UN, this and that, but we also work with the World Bank and regional organizations. It's always anchored with a regional, regional organization in Africa, it's the African Union, in the Great Caribbean, it's the Association for Caribbean States. So tying back into these things that we discuss, discussed in the previous slides on the approach, we are pursuing an evidence-based approach. We're also trying to generate political momentum through this uh, coalition building and agendas. And then that hopefully leads to action that is people-centered and takes people into account when we're trying to tackle the climate crisis and when we try to address migration across these regions. And I should say that it, we work across these different, you see these different terms here, climate action, migration, displacement, and sustainable development. Three different agendas that operate on, on the, the, in the international space that we're all trying to bind together in, in these initiatives. So how are we trying to do this is that we're doing uh, modeling of people and population modeling and migration modeling of how people are foreseen to be moving in the future based on different, different data sets, crop yield, water availability, migration patterns, other things that are, have to do with, with climate change and, and how that's going to affect people. I'm not going to go into RCPs, SSPs, there's beautiful information online and Sarah might mention a little bit about that, uh, but they're basically how you set up these different scenarios for the future in terms of development and also in terms of emissions. And yeah, we do this up until 2050 to get a pretty good picture down to, to, to rather granular, granular information on how that will look in the different regions up to 2050. We also couple this with looking at, here it comes again, hotspots. We'll go into these hotspots to conduct qualitative research through partners and, 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 and people in our network. So we're looking at, for example, here are the, the regions in Africa that we have gone to and done this. You'll see Lagos, you see Guane, you see Beira, etc. But we have done focus groups and interviews to get a better understanding of what's behind these numbers that we see in, in, in the modeling work. So both seeing what's happening right now, but also seeing people's outlooks for the future which Sarah will talk more about. Then this is leads to consultations. So we conducted a consultation process in Africa, and we will do one in the Great Caribbean as well. The one in Africa had over 700 entities participating in different formats. Uh, everything from community members, academia, policymakers, NGOs. I think we even had private sector in some of them. So we covered quite a lot of stakeholder groups in there. Um, so 
These also leads to the creation of an agenda for action, which we'll get back, which we'll, we'll get back to. Um, but it basically is this bridge between the modeling data, the information from the, from the, from the qualitative work, and how we can analyze that and, and turn it into something that's actionable. We also have stakeholder forums and engage with different constituencies. I, as you heard in the introduction, work particularly with youth. Uh, and there we have, especially since that's the most advanced, advanced initiative, a very vibrant African youth network that is working across uh, different parts of, 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 our, of, our, of our initiatives. But I would definitely like to mention that they have for COP last year to develop the Africa Climate Mobility, Climate Mobility Youth Declaration with the African Union Youth Envoy uh, and various youth groups that they presented. Uh, and, and they're trying to find different ways to how to take our, our, our data and our research and bring it out into what's actionable from a youth perspective. So looking at the modeling and the, the research um, and, and the consultations, what that leads to, uh, Sarah was one of the lead authors, so she's going to talk more about how this was done, but it led to uh, the African Shifts Report and the Agenda for Action. The report is online, there's a link there, you can find it after. Sarah will also go through the details, I'll not speak a lot about it, but that is basically taking all that information together and putting it out in a format that hopefully is digestible and not your usual UN report. Um, and also the Agenda for Action, that are the actions that we are looking to, to hopefully drive up until 2030. And here, the, for Africa, I should say that this is something that's done for all the regions, but this might look different for the Greater Caribbean. For Africa, this was the agenda that was advanced or uh, put forward in, in this context. It's focused on our plan, empower and transform. And we have these different eight, eight different actions that touches upon different parts of what we think needs to be done, or not what we think needs to be done, but people in these in this consultations com came forward with as, as actionable things that we need to see leading up to 2030 when it comes to climate mobility in Africa. Also want to mention this, we tried to put all this information on a digital platform as well. We not, not only just tried, we actually did it. And it's, it, it, it is a more digestible way to communicate the stories and storytelling is an important part on how to address this uh, and make this comprehensible. Because there is modeling going up until 2050, but that's not always easy to, for, uh, to understand what that means for people. So. We have interviews, we have videos, we have different stories, we have the data. The data is available there. You can go on and play with it yourself, the different data sets, and see how Africa is, will be affected according to the modeling. Everything is available online, and you can go and check it out there. I want to wrap up my part here by talking a little bit about how we bring this ecosystem together and how we're trying to advance the coalitions. So this is from COP last year, where we had the first climate mobility pavilion trying to bring the climate mobility discussion into the COP space, which has not been done before. Uh, there have been, of, I don't want to discredit, there are certain actors that of course have operated in the, in the climate uh, conference space, but it's not been a dedicated pavilion. So trying to bring the ecosystem together, we put this pavilion together and had over 70 events over 10 days, uh, with everything from heads of state to, to, to community activists participating and coming together. Also last week, as Tony mentioned, we had the chance to meet Tony, and Tony was on one of the panels. We had a Climate Mobility Summit uh, during the, on the margins of the UN General Assembly, bringing together the same sort of variation of, of stakeholders. You see Mayor Yvonne from Sierra Leone, from Freetown. You see the President of Guatemala in the middle. You see the, he the head of the, Africa, uh, the Association for Caribbean States, uh, Rodolfo Sabonje, standing in the middle as well, as well as various just UN entities an academic as well from another institution. We don't have to talk about which institution, but it's hiding up in the corner. Um, hopefully Yale next time. <laughs> um, and with that, we're moving into the <coughs> work that we've done in Africa. Maybe just to um, dovetail with the, where David ended and kind of you know connect the dots a little bit. So w w this, this initiative has ambitions really on three different levels. Um, we started at the regional level, but we're working across different regions to connect efforts at the global level. And at the same time, as I'll discuss a little further, going down from the regional level down to the national and community level. So we're trying to really connect efforts across these different levels of governance. And as David already described, also working across different sectors of policymaking, as well as across different stakeholders. So it's really kind of a pretty intricate um, puzzle that we're trying to solve. Um, and it's 
I think on the one hand, driven by the urgency of the climate crisis, as Tony mentioned, but I think it's also really driven by our analysis of the current geopolitical environment and the need to elevate the voices of the global majority in what is the climate conversation. So as David mentioned, we have um, a, a discourse on climate that's driven by mitigation and decarbonization, which is important. But for the majority of people in the world that are most affected by the climate crisis, there's very little de to decarbonize in their lives. Um, and so how do we elevate their concerns in the global conversation? That is very much what drives kind of our work. Um, for the Africa um, climate mobility, I actually don't have a clicker, so I will have to ask you to click forward. Um, I'll go a bit through our findings. David has explained the process. So we did modeling, we did field research, we did consultations, we put together a report. These are some of our findings and I'll work you, walk you through the substance now and then we'll come back to more of the process conversation. Um, this is not our finding, this is from the IPCC, but I think it's fairly um, common knowledge. We have this discrepancy between uh, Africa's greenhouse gas emissions, what I just mentioned. There are very few countries that have you know, significant work to do on decarbonization in Africa. Um, but when we look at the climate risk, it's very high for much of the continent. So you have very little contribution to the problem, but very high exposure to and vulnerability to the problem. Um, we also looked at, and this is thanks to research done by our colleague, Dr. Nick Simpson, who was a co-author of the report. Um, we also looked at what is the level of climate change literacy across the continent. Um, and they have, they work, this is based on um, Afrobarometer data. Um, and they have looked at, uh, at the sub-national level, different districts, what's the level of climate change literacy and found very high uh, discrepancies within countries and across countries. Um, and I think it dovetails with um, some of the findings that you presented, Tony, last week, which is that you still have, um, quite low levels of climate change knowledge in many parts of the continent. Um, generally, the awareness is higher in cities and urban areas. It's lower in rural areas and more remote kind of border regions. Um, but that doesn't necessarily always dovetail with people's lived experiences, as we'll see from our own um, field research. But basically, if we're just going with the kind of, have people heard of climate change? Do they know what the impacts might be on their livelihoods? The rates are quite low, especially in some of the most vulnerable areas. So this is based on the uh, both quantitative and qualitative data collection. So we did surveys, but also interviews. Um, and this was done by the Mixed Migration Center for us. Um, in those seven locations, David showed a map with seven locations across the continent. This is where this was done. Um, we had a mix of rural and urban areas, uh, coastal, different types of climate impacts that were already occurring. Some areas affected by drought, others experiencing cyclones, sea level rise, different types of climate impacts. Um, and what we found across those seven locations was that overall, the majority of people very much notice climate disruptions in their lives, like they're aware that this is happening, but it's not uh, something that they um, consider, or the, most of them do not consider to move because of those disruptions. Um, so for a majority, more than 50%, um, they say, yeah, you know, we see stuff is happening, we take certain measures to try to adapt, but moving is not necessarily one that we would want to take or are considering taking. You have almost a quarter though that say, yeah, we would maybe move if we had the resources to do so. So the constraint on moving has often has to do with the resources that people have available or their own perception of those resources. If we look at reasons um, for moving, you can see, and this is not surprising, I think from the literature, but it confirms a lot of existing research um, that 
very much climate change interacts with other factors that make people want to move, consider moving. Um, and here we looked at economic impacts, um, so livelihood factors most of the time. And you see that in most of the cases, it's more livelihood or income related reasons that would make people consider moving or want to move. The outliers are really in areas where you had fairly recent extreme events, like Beira, for example, which was hit by cyclone, I think it's covered here, but um, had a fairly high percentage of people saying, yes, we want to move. Um, similarly, Chihuahua in Malawi, which was like hit by different impacts alternating between flooding and drought. And so where people were kind of at a point where they were like, OK, we are ready to move because of this, because it's just been too much whiplash. Um, but generally, for example, in a Lagos um, or Alexandria, where people had some um, perception of climate impacts, it was mostly about like condi living conditions. How can we move to a better neighborhood? But it was less driven by the climate factor. Um, this is the gender breakdown. And what we found um, across locations, mostly, not, it's not always true, but mostly women were more reluctant to move than men. So they had less intentions to move. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, this is by age group. We found that the young people were those most prone to wanting to move. So the majority of young people still said, I'm not considering moving. Um, but they were the largest age group that were con um, had actually plans to move. Like, um, were more actively um, engaged in, in, in making those plans. Next slide. So then we go to the quantitative work. And this is based on the modeling that David briefly presented. Um, we did two types of modeling. We looked at cross-border migration. And we looked at internal movements. And um, we did not manage to do both within the same model. So we had two separate models. Um, this is the findings for the cross-border movement. And this was a pilot, I would say. So um, the methodology was quite new. Um, and the results are, I think, fairly um, significant, but also um, you know, in, in the context of the overall population development in Africa, not overwhelming. So you have um, a fairly small percentage of overall projected movement being related to climate change, right? Like this is the total projection of um, cross-border migrants that could be moving by 2050. Um, and then within that, the climate-related movement is a fairly small percentage. Um, and the same is true um, in, the, in the more optimistic, uh, sorry, this is the more optimistic scenario in terms of climate uh, impacts, and this is the more pessimistic scenario. Um, so you also see that actually the, um, the impacts of climate change have a more reducing impact on cross-border mobility, which makes sense, again, if we look at the need for people to have resources to move. Um, next slide. Then we have internal movements, so people moving within countries, and that is um, a more significant amount of people projected to be moving um, anywhere between 46 to 113 million. So if we stay within the scenarios, um, the most likely uh, outcome under a kind of high emissions future is around 88 million people, 4% of the African population moving within their countries. But it could go up to 113. Um, a more um, optimistic scenario when it comes to development and climate emissions has sees a lower um, range of internal mobility. And this is um, the hotspots analysis. So one thing is to try to put numbers on the movement. I think the more important maybe 
potential of this analysis lies with understanding the geographic distribution of where is those where are those movements likely to happen. So what this map shows are areas that are likely to be origins or destinations, respectively, of movements. Um, and you see that they're quite concentrated in the Sahel belt, um, on the coasts, and then also on some of the border regions, like Lake Victoria, for example, you have the border region between um, Ethiopia, Sudan, Eritrea. Um, so this, this is what um, we'll be using going forward, working with governments at the more national, sub, sub regional, and local level. This is hotspots analysis. So, this is the next step after we've done the continental level analysis and had kind of have presented our results um, and agenda for action. We're now working with individual countries sub-regional organizations and cities to take these hotspots analysis down to the country local sub-regional level to help them start making sense of prospective population shifts within their territory um, and how our analysis cross-references with data that they may ha be having um, at the local and national level. So we're trying to integrate different sources of data and knowledge at the national level, at the local level, um, with a view to supporting planning, um, policy development at that level of intervention um, and eventually drive towards projects and programming in those hotspots areas. Um, so this first the first country where we're doing this is Uganda. Um, this is the steps of the process, and it mirrors very much the kind of process we've gone through at the regional level. So we start with this analysis of different data um, and research, um, bringing together our modeling data with other sources of data and information. We go through a phase of consultations now within the country, um, and then want to develop what we call a blueprint. This could, I think, take different forms depending on the country context. But the ultimate goal is to influence both adaptation and development planning that's happening at the country level with this information about like where are the areas, the geographies, but also the groups of people and the sectors of your economy that you should be particularly concerned about when it comes to people moving. Um, this is from the climate mobility prof profile we have pulled together for Uganda, um, starting with climate information, um, what are the trends uh, in the country, um, next slide, um, what are the hazards and, and how are people affected by them. So for Uganda you see different types of hazards. Um, affecting, dif um, you don't see this here, but they're affecting different parts of the country. Um, next slide. Um, then again, we're looking at the climate literacy rates based on the data we had, we used also for the continental level analysis. Um, so understanding different levels of climate literacy across the country. Um, and then we are drawing on our own data to look at what's the situation for Uganda. So how will cross-border flows for Uganda look like um, over the next 30 years? Um, here you can see most, more, much more movement projected to go out of the country than coming into the country. Um, next slide. Internal projections, um, this is what we uh, saw for the continental level here in Uganda, the high point is 5.1 million potential internally displaced people or people moving. And this is the hotspots uh, map for Uganda. Um, one is the kind of most 
likely where different scenarios of the modeling have the highest level of agreement. This is how you get to this map. Um, and this map is the actual numbers of people projected to move from one part of the country to another part of the country. And this, those pixels are roughly four, four to five square kilometers. Um, so that's the resolution. And then we look at what are existing factors of vulnerability, such as the climate literacy rates, but also where, for example, existing refugee camps or refugee populations. Um, so looking at them as a group of concern, but also looking at things like poverty levels and, and um, marginalization. Next slide. Um, and this is our analysis by cities. Um, so we have different ways of looking at the data for the continental level. We did a geographic uh, regions analysis. So we looked at urban areas, we looked at rural areas, coastal areas separately, and we're doing the same for at the country level. So this is the um, city level analysis, which are the cities um, that will be growing because there's overall urbanization and population growth going on, but where climate mobility could be leading to a dent in that growth. So basically you have cities that are growing, but because of climate impacts, there are some people forecast to leave, predicted to leave that city, which kind of suggests that overall conditions in the city could become more hazardous also for people who are not leaving. Um, and then you have cities that are um, projected to grow due to climate mobility. So where the city is, where, where climate mobility is actually contributing meaningfully to the growth of the city. And you see kind of like this flip side here in Uganda. Um, next one. So what are we doing next with this analysis? Um, we're planning to have consultations, engagement with stakeholders across Uganda, so going to different parts of the country to share our initial findings, but to understand what are the local realities and how, how does this inter intersect with what's going on, how people are perceiving climate impacts and the movement of people, the implications that already result at the moment. Um, with a view to co-developing recommendations for action, looking at what could be pilot interventions in areas that are particularly impacted, and then also seeing at how do we get to a level of um, granularity that could actually support decision making, like if you wanted to decide to put water infrastructure in a certain place, or to build more housing in a certain place. The modeling that we have is not sufficiently detailed. Um, and you see it has these large uncertainty intervals. So you know, if we wouldn't be like, yeah, you should really put your housing here because our model says you know, this. So the idea is also like, how do we start based on more locally collected data to build sub decision support tools which would be more agent-based models, so like actually understanding like what are the local dynamics and how do we s develop support tools that can, um, that can actually inform these kinds of inf infrastructure investment decisions, policy um, uh, making at a more local and granular level. Um, yep. And now we kind of like take a step back up. <laughs> so in Africa, we've kind of gone from the continental down to the country and local. Um, in the greater Caribbean, we're starting where we started in Africa two years ago um, um, with an effort at kind of mobilizing interest and political buy-in for the initiative, um, which was officially launched last year. Uh, so we've been holding a number of events, um, just 
socializing this idea and this initiative with governments in the region. Um, we have started modeling and we're using a different approach this time. So um, the model that we use for Africa is called a gravity model. It's based, ma mainly focused on kind of geographic assumptions about um, how people are distributed in space. And then when climate impacts kind of are layered in, how does that affect the attractiveness, attractiveness of places vis-a-vis -vis each other? This is an econometric model we're using this time. So it looks much more at how climate impacts will affect different sectors of the economy and labor productivity in different sectors of the economy and how that will affect people's decisions to go to certain areas or move out of other areas. Um, so we're expecting to have um, quite different types of results. It will still give us an idea of, again, like what are hotspots areas, but it will be much more tied to what is the economic impact of climate change and how is this affecting people's decisions to move. Um, and this is our roadmap. We're working towards COP29, so that means end of 2024, to basically arrive what, at what David laid out, the process of first doing the research, then doing the consultations, having a report, having stories, bringing it all to COP, um, and then again, like in that region as well, starting to work with individual champion countries to look at what does this mean for you? How do we bring this down to the local level? Um, while at the same time, continuing to build that momental, momentum in global policy fora. So that was a lot, <laughs> but now the floor is yours. Questions? <laughs> Comments also, <laughs> Um, I just have a quick question going back to your point on using different models for different regions. Um, would you mind explaining a little bit more of why you decide, your team decided to use the gravity-based model for Africa and then the more sectorial economic-based economic approach for the Caribbean and maybe, maybe different kinds of models you use for other regions that your project covers? Yeah. Should I go ahead? Um, the main reason was that for the gravity model to work well, you basically need some territory to move people around on. <laughs> and with the, a lot of the small islands in the Caribbean, it's very difficult. Like the model is struggling to basically project movements if the, if the territory is very small. Um, and so the, I think the search for a different alternative model led us to this econometric model. We, we had a workshop with all kinds of different modelers presenting different approaches that they are currently pursuing. What we are looking for, I think, is always a, an approach that is globally applicable, which limits options. So we're trying to find models that can work across different regions, ultimately. So we, we um, I think, are looking to, yeah, to, to as much as possible get inputs in terms of the data that are region specific, but have a model that can be applied across different contexts. Um, yeah, but the main reason was that we were trying to look at these small island states and the gravity model, at, according to our colleagues who are doing the modeling, is not so good at looking at population redistribution in these very small territories. Can you speak a little bit more about the de decision support tools that sort of are, are in need now and how they interplay with the current models that you have and like what you would hope that they would answer? Yeah, so I think, um, again, like our model gives kind of an indication of, okay, these are areas that you should be concerned about or look at for action. <laughs> um, but then when it comes to actually guiding decisions on you know, again, putting in place specific infrastructure or maybe uh, expanding social protection programs or what have you, like actually kind of a better understanding of um, 
well, how many people, when are they going to move, um, based on which triggers or thresholds. Um, you need something that is more informed by what's actually really going on in the country, because what we know is that the model that we have is informed by global climate models that often struggle to represent what's happening in Africa because there's not so much data collection and data available. Um, so you have often assumptions being made also on the migration side about like, well, let's you know use Ghana and expand the data from Ghana across these other five countries for which we don't have data, that kind of thing. Um, which then if you're actually in one of those other five countries is not so helpful, right? Like you don't really, your model is not informed by the data that actually is reflecting the local reality. Um, and so if you want something that can actually support decisions on like, should we build a seawall here or put water pipes there or build housing here? You need something that reflects more like actual dynamics in the country. Um, and you have companies and consultancies that do that kind of work. Um, so we're trying to see, you know, once we have our more broader analysis of like, okay, you know, we know that these coastal areas you should be concerned about. How do we bring that expertise to our government partners to then say, okay, let's do the more granular analysis of, you know, you might want to put this piece of infrastructure in this way or, yeah. So to actually kind of like get started on specific projects. Mm -hmm. yep. okay, yeah, so thank you both so much. Um, aside from the suggestions or the action that the results of these models might you know, point out for the countries that will experience you know, the harshest effects of the climate crisis. Have you, I guess what have you found in terms of showing this data to the countries that are the biggest causes and had, do you feel as if this kind of a finding or these kinds of reports are moving the needle politically or is it just another drop in the ocean? a good question. I mean, I think the main concern usually for countries in the global north, if you will, is, is more around like who's coming to us, right? Like, do you have figures for Africans moving to Europe or Latin Americans moving to the US? Um, I think what we are trying to um, convey is the message that, you know, most people are moving close to home, which is already true, but will most likely be true in the future too from what we know and what we observe so yes there will be also south north movements but the majority of movement is happening close to home um, and people are not all you know clamoring to leave um, and so really what we're trying to i think pinpoint is a the need for scaling up adaptation investment which is not a new message but to reinforce that point um, but then also to guide that investment, right? Like to say, if you're trying to, again, like in a more anticipatory fashion, not just kind of try to get on top of disasters and, and um, uh, do recovery on a perpetual basis, but to try to look ahead and see how can we um, get ahead of the curve in certain um, instances and say, okay, this is where people are likely to move. If we can put investment here now, you know, then the city does not have to become overwhelmed with informal settlements where living conditions are terrible. You can start putting infrastructure in place now. Um, you can um, start, you know, thinking about economic sectors where people could find jobs now. Um, so that is a little bit the logic um, on what we're hoping to achieve is basically a get to. Um, a clear message around like, you know, get out of your navel gazing, <laughs> if you will. You know, the problems are, are acute and they're, they're for people already real now. Um, and then, um, you know, start planning ahead and supporting countries um, before, before the situation becomes a crisis. I'm thinking back at the Africa model and the maps that you had of the places where people would be fleeing from and where they would be going to, so the red versus the green locations. What variables are associated or seem to be predictive of either of those two locations where people would be moving from or moving to? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the, um, the model generally assumes that people will be drawn to more densely populated areas. So it has kind of like a bias towards urbanization, assuming that people will want to be where there's more amenities and that those places are more attractive. Um, but then the, basically the, what it does is like it looks at a future where you have just development happening and where would people be in terms of population distribution. And then it compares that to a scenario where you have climate impacts happening. Um, and the climate impacts are on water availability, are on crop productivity, and are on rangeland productivity. So to cover kind of grazing, um, livestock-based uh, livelihoods. Um, and those are the main kind of factors that influence uh, the attractiveness of places in the future. So you'll see basically the model moving people out of areas that where water availability goes down and into areas where water availability goes up. Um, we've tried to um, capture things like conflict in the model, but it's very imperfect at this stage in the sense that you cannot predict conflict into the future. So you kind of have to assume like certain areas that had conflict in the past will be less attractive because of conflict in the future. But we know that that's not really how it works, where like the conflict may be moving somewhere else. So that's a limitation. And it also um, obviously doesn't um, account so much. I, th I think it does account to a certain extent for um, existing mobility patterns. Um, but it obviously it cannot capture all the intricacies of like family ties and ethnic ties and you know like that drive a lot of people's decisions for where they're going to go. So there's actually data, current contemporary data on how people already move within some of these locations that you can draw on as an input into the model. Well, the problem is that I think you 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 could do that for these more smaller scale agent based models. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to actually really say like, okay, we're in Accra, Ghana, and we want to understand like how my people be moving into Accra, I think you could start like really looking at what are the existing migration patterns and how do we build a model based on that. But for these kind of like models that are trying to do this at scale, it's very difficult to have, I mean, you don't have that data at scale, right? Like, so that's the um, incompatibility, if you will, like that you need data that is available across different locations to have these kind of global models or whole of continent models. But as also I think it's important to have the different stages of the research as well with the modeling that takes it down to the other parts as well with both the, 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 the qualitative part and the consultation but also then yeah why it's important you might say then why are you like you've done the work why you go to the national level local level of course that sounds like but it is really important to understand the real drivers of this to talk to those people. I think that that's the experience as well to really get a sense of, yeah, a, a decision to move is not easy and it's usually not as, as, as you cannot summarize it as it's in, it's in one point driving it. It's usually more complex and, and a few, few points going into it. Um. So thank you for the presentation and I have also like a question related to the, uh, the assumptions that you uh, have. So every model, the result of a model depends on the assumption that you're taking. So if you can tell us a little bit more about how you're gathering that information and what challenges you have encountered as well um, um, in order to building that and how to calibrate basically also with things that you see um, in, in the future. And the other question that I have is that, so you have these ranges of probabilities of uh, what is the forecast that the, the results that you can see here. Are you building with that as well, like different scenarios depending on how extreme you can see or certain parameters that go uh, after some level as well in order to have the, know, the recommendation or, or the work that you are going to be working with the different companies? I'm not sure I understood the second part of your question. Um, on the first part, um, so we didn't build the model. Um, we work with colleagues who um, are 
on the one hand at City University of New York and Columbia University. And they built this model originally for the World Bank's groundswell reports and then upgraded it for our purposes. So we built in, they used different population data for this model. Um, they used more layers of climate information. So they put in a flood mask, for example. They added this conflict mask. Um, so there were different, more factors layered in than that was the case for the groundswell model. Um, and the calibration, as far as I know, was done basically picking, again, countries for which data is available and looking at, in the past, how have certain things like drought or flooding affected migration and use that to kind of predict the future. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of kind of things where you know, you, you say, okay, again, like what, you know, what we find for Cameroon and Ghana and five other countries, we're gonna now use across other countries, right? Where you can always say, well, how accurate is that as an, as an assumption to be made? Um, on the second part, yeah. So on the second part, what I was saying is that, so you have a path of the more likely scenario, but mm -hmm. you also are uh, showing uh, the result, like a probability of this event happening. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that given that more extremes event are happening more often, are you able as well to build like different scenarios? Okay, if, I don't know, if, uh, temperature rises by this much, which I don't know exactly, 0.5 or whatever figure you, you want to put there. Uh, this is more likely to be the effect, so you will be more like on the tails of the distribution and basically also given the, uh, as I said, work with the government in terms of, uh, uh, well, trying to adapt to the different uh, events. Yeah. Yeah, so we, are, uh, for this exercise, did four scenarios. And actually, in the report, we mainly focused on the kind of pessimistic scenario um, in the sense that the optimistic scenario was really we stay within 1.5, you know, we, we're meeting the Paris targets. And we said that is not the most likely outcome, right? So we actually have mostly in the report focused on the more pessimistic scenario. Um, but then said, you know, it, even with the more kind of negative climate trajectory, you can see that the development trajectory matters, right? Like because there's basically these two variables, how are you doing on development and how are you doing on climate? And even if climate is not going well, if the emissions reductions are not happening fast, whether you make progress on development makes a big difference in terms of the vulnerability of your population. And so that's been the main message for African governments, basically, from the report to say, like, you know, you can not do so much about the emissions reductions. There's not so much in your power. I mean, you can obviously advocate and so on. But at the end of the day, there's not so much, again, to decarbonize in a lot of these countries. Um, but you can do quite a lot about the development. Well, quite a lot. You can do something about the development trajectory. Um, and that's where, uh, that's where the kind of difference can be made in terms of outcomes. So just to follow up on that. So, I mean, I think you said that under the Rocky Road scenario, which is the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. uh, uh, migration actually is slightly lower than in a more optimistic scenario, which is an eye-opening Point, and I think you said it's because that people won't even have the resources that they need in order to migrate, which means they're trapped, which means things are much worse in location where people are, right? I'm interpreting that right? Yeah. And I think um, from this Caribbean model, this comes out even more starkly that you basically just have a share of the population that's going to be very poor, not very likely to be moving, especially not across international borders. Um, and that's maybe the people that you should be most concerned about. Um, but yeah, I mean, we found that, and again, this is our interpretation, but I think it is consistent also with some of the you know, field research findings and what we know from the existing migration research that especially going longer distance international is 
expensive. You need contacts, you need money. Um, and so if people are moving, they're moving short distances if they're not, if they don't have those contacts and those resources. They're not moving like across the continent, let alone to like Europe or anywhere. There is a question on the chat for the, uh, so Elisa is asking, first uh, she wants to thank you for the very interesting presentation. And uh, she would like to inquire if you also provide support to policymakers regarding the social, economic, and cultural integration of migrants. And does your organization offer da data about the regions and condition of origin while also working to raise awareness within the host community? Additionally, do you, have, do you suggest best practices for social inclusion? <laughs> Hopefully at some point. <laughs> no, I know, I mean, um, so I think the, the interesting piece about this hotspots mapping is that it gives you both end of the story. Um, it doesn't allow you actually to make connections between uh, uh, places. So you can't really say, OK, these people are coming from here and they're going to there. Um, it can only tell you, well, here is where we think population will decline, and here is where we think it will increase. Um, but I do think that this analysis of where population will increase is, is very interesting and valuable. Um, and I've come from quite a bit of work with city and local authorities. Um, and so I think we do see that as a very important constituency of our effort. Um, so looking at, you know, A, what, what do they already know? Because there's been a lot of lessons learned from large scale displacement crisis, whether they're climate related or not like Lima, Peru taking in a million Venezuelans or, you know, so there is a lot of, I think, things that cities have already done and know how to do and it's not always well publicized. Um, but then also, yes, we do, I think, ultimately would like to get to a point where through this knowledge hub, um, we, we start collecting more information on the solutions, right? Like so far, a lot of the climate mobility research has been focused on the drivers, like understanding how important is climate as a driver of people's movement. Um, where will people leave? Where will they go? I think it, increasingly you want to shift the research agenda also towards this question of, well, what is what what can be done in response, and what what do we know about things that are working? And I think that that also covers a part that was not really part of this presentation, which comes to our flagship programs that hopefully is going to address some part of that that's going to focus on green skills, climate literacy, water solution, and data. So of course it ties into the research that's presented here, but I think that there's ambition and there's also interest and also already some efforts going on through these programs that's going to address hopefully both the host communities and, and people staying, here, as Tony mentioned, people being trapped or, or not having the, the, the opportunity to decide where they're going to move. So hopefully those parts will cover so social inclusion to some degree, because I know that was part of the question, uh, but definitely the economic part when it comes to green skills. Yeah. So we've reached five o'clock, so I think let's... Well, I have that, yeah, I think we have 15 minutes oh, more, in okay. there, but uh, and I, I have one question and then uh, other people if they want. So, um, what, uh, yeah, I would like to know as well how much you include the risk um, into the uh, into your model, and basically, in what I'm thinking is about people insurance against these events. I understand that probably in developing countries, and uh, not everybody is um, able to ensure against uh, uh, climate change, but I guess working with the governments actually in order to sort of incorporate the, the risk of living in these areas that you have identified as being more prone to, uh, to these uh, uh, yeah, problems. Yeah. I think this um, goes a bit to what we discussed, like how do we get then to more kind of decision support? Um, I mean, I do think we know that social protection, for example, can be both 
a means for people to stay in places, but it can also be a means for people to move, right, depending on the context. Um, so I think in terms of what is a appropriate response, I guess we want to make sure that people have agency and a certain degree of well-being, whether they stay or move, right? So, so the, um, the intervention, I think, whether it's risk insurance or it's social protection, um, I think if we're kind of trying to measure success by whether we manage to make people stay or have them move, might be tricky. Um, and I think that's another question that is kind of on the table as we're advocating for climate mobility to become part of adaptation programming, adaptation policy. Um, how do we measure success? Um, what does that look like? Um, but yeah, to your, to your point, I think it's definitely one of our action agenda items is around this, like, you know, how do you just basically ensure that people can make decisions about moving, A, with having information about climate risks, so this goes to climate literacy, but also access to climate services, um, but also how do they have kind of the resources that they would need to be able to make those decisions. So, and in, in a lot of cases that will mean social protection or access to climate risk insurance, like things that will actually allow them to have a certain degree of agency um, in the context of disasters and climate impacts. And I think that that covers some part of it, the social part and economic part, but I think they're also the part about culture and heritage that we also try to cover, but that is not covered by those factors when it comes, uh, yeah, for certain communities. So I think that that's something that I just want to put a pin in that we are trying to address as well. That I know was just your question, Teresa, but I think that that goes beyond this question that was asked online. And this, it, like, it's not only the social and the economic, but also the culture and heritage of a community. And the community, yeah, hopefully it comes that in, in, the, in the third phase of things to really see what we can do for communities there. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so interesting. Um, and, and so many questions, but I, I want to start <laughs> with one. Um, and uh, could you clarify, please, when, when, uh, when, when you speak about zones like where people tend to migrate, like green zones mostly, mm -hmm. uh, the, are those better off somehow in any parameters uh, like as a result of climate change, or they are just less worse off? Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any areas which are better off somehow, uh, like physically, environmentally, as a result of climate change in the continent, or maybe economically because of the migration and like, labor uh, somehow, or the whole continent it would be the worst off just at a different pace? That's a really good question. Yeah. I think you have both. So you have actually situations where people are basically just going from one bad situation to maybe a less bad situation. So for example, if, you're, if the results from Mozambique show quite a lot of movement into the coastal areas that are, we know, very vulnerable, but because the um, conditions in the rural hinterlands are predicted to get worse, and so the model is moving people to the coast where you have bigger cities, um, but that doesn't mean they're out of a risky environment. Um, but then you also have, I think, certain areas of the continent that could actually see conditions improve, like where crop yields are forecast to improve due to more rainfall. Um, so, so you have a little bit of both, but I um, would say, very often, especially this movement into urban areas, is not necessarily a movement into much better conditions, especially if urbanization isn't handled well, right? And that goes to your point around like economic opportunity. I think a lot depends on, um, again, like forward planning and investment, right? To see how can, um, how can that be absorbed? Like we know people will be moving into these areas. Can you already put infrastructure in place now that will make it easier afterwards to build up housing. For example, if you already have the um, basic infrastructure in place, then it's easier rather than trying to retrofit informal settlements that have already sprung up, things like that. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh, it's not necessarily a, a rosy pic. Right? Like there's many places where you're like, oh, these will be climate havens. <laughs> yeah. And I think you should yeah, not be fooled by the colors of green and red. It doesn't mean that it's it's green, it's green light or, or red. It's it's very simplistic to say, but it doesn't cover that part. I think no. Yeah. Just one, one quick question. I know we're running against time, but I'm curious um, about your strategies around kind of evidence uptake and um, sort of uh, sensitization and localization of, of these tools and this information. Obviously, it'll be as good as whoever uses it for some of the planning and decision making. And it strikes me as it's potentially a wide array of different policymakers who could avail themselves of, of this information. So. Yeah, I'm curious how you're you're working in collaboration with national subnational actors to to kind of promote uptake of this information and to promote uptake of the tools that will be developed. Yeah, so I think right now we see it mainly, and David can speak to that more. But I think we see it mainly as an awareness raising tool um, and also as a tool again to inform this kind of global level, more advocacy conversations, bringing people together, starting this conversation, putting the topic on the agenda. When it comes to the more policy formulation, then it really becomes this work that I outlined with like Uganda, where it's like, OK, let's work with this government. Let's see you know, how concretely can we help you to make this part of your planning, make this part of your policies. Um, and how ultimately, you know, we've, where we want to get to is like, help Uganda unlock money from the Green Climate Fund to have specific projects in place, right? Like that's where we would like to get to with these countries. Um, and so I think we have kind of probably different strategies with different audiences. Um, and also still working on our strategy. <laughs> so that's also true, but yeah. No, I think, yeah. I think you covered it, Sarah, but I think it's also part of then yeah, the climate literacy part that talks about climate literacy, but then we also have the climate mobility literacy part, which is, yeah, you can see the numbers there on climate literacy. I don't think we're close to that on the climate mobility, trying to merge these agendas and have a conversation about it here. I don't think that's a necessarily a conversation in the US or in Europe where I'm from, but less so there even. So I think that that's both on the national, sub-regional, but also on the, yeah, looking at COP, we talked about COP before, I think it's starting to make its way in there. We said we did a pavilion. It doesn't mean that it's front and center in negotiations, but there are different things we're trying to do there to, to bring it up. Then, yeah, we can talk more about, we're trying to do these flagship programs as well, and also working with youths to see like, what does this information mean for, to you and, and what, what, is, what, would, what would it be helpful to take it and do it? And I think that that's something that, especially the youth that I work with are kind of keen to figure out with their peers in terms of, right, now we know this, how do we go and, 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 and take action on this? Of course, there's more formal processes with governments that we're working on the national level, but there are also these constituency-based, since you mentioned, yeah, other types of organizations. There are a lot of youth that have a lot of interest in seeing this is happening a lot in their communities. I think that where this idea of ecosystem building comes in, like I, I, I mean, just looking at the conversation here in the US and how that's evolving around like, you know, climate displacement, climate um, refugees. Um, I think you will, in each context, need kind of people that figure out what the narrative needs to look like locally. Um, because I think in most contexts, it's not an easy conversation, right? To talk to people about where they might have to abandon their homes. And we've heard quite a few stories of people going back to places that they were relocated from, right? Like where the government said, okay, Beira is one example. We heard the same in Uganda where like the government said, okay, you have keep having landslides. We got to move you out of this area, but this area is very fertile for farming. So people will be coming back there. In Beira, they come back because they do fishing, right? And if you relocate them to the interior, that's just not where their livelihood is. So I think, in practice, a lot of these things are hard to do, and governments are often not super keen to take this on as a, as a conversation with their people. Um, and so I think that's something where I don't think we can necessarily give, I think we can give governments tools, but to figure out like how do we talk about this in a way that resonates with our community, in a way that resonates with our people, I think that's 
the work that they will have to do and where we will also learn, right? What, what, what does that look like? And I think that that's also a little bit what led us here because we talked to Tony last year trying to figure out how to talk about these things. <laughs> so I think that, yeah, there are people here that are trying to figure out for the US and we're trying to, I mean, we're, determined, we're determined to figure it out to some degree across the world when it comes to climate mobility. I think we're working more hands on, um, uh, David mentioned the Rising Nations Initiative, which is also a regional effort, but is slightly differently organized. And there it's a much more hands-on effort with one particular country, which is Tuvalu, that is facing um, submersion <laughs> this century. And so there it's much more hands-on thinking about this, like how can the government go about formulating a strategy with with the people, like with involvement of the people. What does that look like? How do we, on the one hand, keep fighting for our right to adapt and to stay while also making preparations for the eventuality that maybe people will have to move? And then what David mentioned, what does that mean for culture and heritage of people? How do you preserve that? What does it mean for their statehood and their sovereignty? So that's a kind of like special project, <laughs> if you will, um, that we're working on and that is getting a little bit more directly into these kinds of questions. Yeah, but uh, Tuvalu being the pilot, but now also like it is for Pacific Atolls in general, but I think it's kind of clear also <laughs> when you start talking about this Rising Nations Initiative that a lot of the things are things that people are thinking about across the world, but especially in the other Pacific countries. So even though, we, yeah, the Rising Nations Initiative is spearheaded by Tuvalu, Marshall Islands and, and Kiribati, there are like as soon as you start talking about it there are other pacific countries that say oh we might not face submersion but these questions of culture and heritage applies to us as well and i feel like when i talk to our colleagues in africa that those are also things that are starting to come up more and more so even if it doesn't it's not existential threats to the same degree there are questions there are, there are questions that are remain yeah i think the urgency the political urgency is different yeah, yeah. Well, with that, thank you very much, and please welcome. Uh, <laughs>